After 17 turbulent years as a criminal court judge in New York, presiding over many high-profile cases, Stuart Nam received the Justice Thurgood Marshall and David Michaels Awards as a champion of individual rights and for courage in exposing injustice. Examining the evidence and newly discovered facts wherever they may lead, he continues to investigate the claims of prisoners throughout the U.S. who profess their innocence. Martin Tankless, as to count two, murder, second degree, guilty. On September 7, 1988, began one of the most troubling criminal cases in American law, the trial of Martin Tankless for the murder of his parents, a complex story of a contested confession, millions of dollars, and multiple suspects. All right, hold on and I'll connect you. I'm connecting you with the ambulance. With that frantic call to the 911 emergency operator, the perplexing tale began to unfold. More than 10 years ago, I became absolutely intrigued by the facts of the Tankliff story. I was so fascinated by this case that I actually sat in as a spectator during the course of the trial. Now that interest was rekindled about five years ago when I received letters from Marty and members of his family. As I pondered the facts and the evidence in this case, I wondered how the jury reached its verdict. Was Marty innocent and set up as he claimed? Or was he a sociopath who was truly guilty of the brutal murders of his parents, Arlene and Seymour Tankliff? Marty, who was 17 when his parents met their untimely deaths, was adopted when three days old. Although Arlene was Christian, he was brought up in the Jewish faith of his birth mother under idyllic circumstances in the exclusive North Shore community of Beltaire. Absolutely wonderful memories. Um, it was uh, great, it was exclusive. Uh, we lived in a small community in the Port Jefferson area of Long Island. Um, because my father owned his own business, he was, he was relatively successful. Um, he was Tankliff Insurance Company. Um, I went to a public school, uh, Earl L. Vandermeulen, uh, in a relatively small community. Um, a lot of the individuals there were affluent, um, middle class individuals, um, and it was a great livelihood. Um, we enjoyed the pleasantries of living in a small waterfront area, uh, which included going to the beaches and fishing and traveling. It was just a really great childhood. It was important for me to talk to Ron Falby and his wife Carol, Marty's cousins. As Ron was executor of the estate and Marty's legal guardian, I was seeking the views of someone really close to the family. Uh, Marty's relationship with, uh, with Seymour was, uh, um, he idolized his father. He, uh, Seymour was like a mentor, you know, if, if you will, for, uh, with, with business and everything else. Marty um, learned a lot from his father. Seymour. Uh, I, I think lived through Marty in a way of uh, just enjoying the things that Marty had. In other words, they got a boat. You know, Marty, Marty wanted a boat, so Seymour got him a boat. And uh, I think he did that as much for Marty as he did it for himself. Uh, the, the big wheel trucks and the, uh, all the other nonsense, you know. They, they enjoyed doing a lot of things together. I think the age difference was so great that he felt more like my son than my brother. 
So it was hard for us to, you know, um, have a camaraderie that you would normally have with, you know, siblings that are closer in age. He was uh, an outgoing kid. He was on the wimpy side. Uh, he was a little, he always would, would uh, chase after the girls. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know, he, he, he was my friend, uh, you know. Uh, he was a little bratty when he was a kid, as I think all little children are. Uh, but he certainly grew up to be a sweet, concerned young man. There was no way to tell this story without hearing Marty's version of the events of September 7th, 1988, firsthand. So I was quite excited to hear that I had been granted clearance to meet with him after some tense negotiations with the state prison authorities. Clinton Correctional Facility is situated just outside the city of Plattsburgh in the small village of Dannemora, opposite the aptly named Breakout Saloon, close to the Canadian border. The gloomy landscape of the village is dominated by the massive concrete prison walls and guard towers. It was hard to believe that I was finally going to meet the man with whom I had been communicating by mail for more than five years. As I approached the largest maximum security facility in the state of New York, the entire atmosphere seemed somewhat surreal. But for Martin Tankliff, this was reality. I was shortly to hear about the morning he will never forget. I'm going to take you back now, Marty, to September 7th, 1988. Can you tell us your best recollection of what time you woke up and what it is you did when you first woke up that morning? Uh, waking up in the morning, um, shortly before 6. Um, and how, I met, how did you know it was before 6? I had an alarm clock. Uh, it was the first day of school. So I remember wanting to get up a little bit early because it was the first day. Uh, went out of my room. Um, uh, first thing I noticed, which was a little odd, was that all the lights were on. Um, all the lights throughout the house were all on? All the lights were out throughout the house. Uh, and when I woke in my room, I looked outside and I saw lights on, which was, would be unusual. Tell us about the area, the physical uh, location, layout, layout of, of from your room to, you, say, you looked into your parents' room. Okay, well, there's a somewhat large corridor um, between the two rooms, um, and there's actually a foyer or hallway that leads into their room. On either side of that little hallway, there are two closets. One's in the outer area, and one is on the inner area. Um, in addition, there's, if you come out of my room and you go straight and you make a left, there's a bathroom there. Uh, if you make a right, you go into the main area of the home. And you looked into the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And what, if anything, where were you when you looked into the, into the um, bedroom? Best of my relics, I walked like, just slightly into the doorway. Okay. And could you see anything? No. So nothing in the bedroom? Nothing in the bedroom. Could you see your mom? Could you see no. your father? No. Okay, what did you do then? Um, after that, I started walking into the main area of the house um, and noticed that the front door was open. Which the front door was open? Was open a little bit, which was very strange. Um, you know, just, you know, be, since we had an alarm system, it was always common just to keep all the doors locked. Um, as I proceeded through the house, all the lights were on, but I didn't see anybody. Uh, once again, this just felt very strange because it was never, you know, in all my years of living there, I'd never experienced something like that. Well, were you scared? I don't know if I was scared, just uncomfortable. I don't know, I don't know if it is. Were you concerned? Concerned, yeah, because it just didn't seem right. Um, and so, you started looking around the house? Started going through the house. The house is a ranch-style house, so you basically just walk you know, from one end to the other of it. Okay, where was the next place you went to then? Um, the living room. Uh, from the living room into the kitchen area. Um, from there, I kept walking. Uh, I noticed that the door to the greenhouse was open. Where, did, where were you heading at that point? Uh, into the gym office area where the card game was the night okay. before. And when you arrived there, were the lights on there? Yes. And what did you see when you arrived there? Uh, my father was there. And where was your father? Sitting in his um, office chair. Can you describe what you saw as you arrived in the room? 
um, a nightmare, uh, devastation, um, something you, you couldn't imagine. Um, he was well. See, was, we we weren't there. I want you okay. to tell us as it's, best it's as hard, you can. It's hard to describe it because um, it was a nightmare. I mean, he was, was actually blood, seated at his desk. Seated at his desk. There was blood on him. Um, he was gagging, um, which uh, I later found out was uh, something he was trying to gag for air. Um, Were his eyes open? I don't remember. Uh -huh. Um, I started screaming and yelling. Well, what did you scream? I, I don't remember the exact words. It was just, you know, complete panic. Um, and what did you do with that? I remember, you know, running over to him, screaming at him, Dad, Dad. Um, I remember... Did you touch him? I, I, at that point, I don't think I did. Um, I know after I'd called 911, I did. When, when you said, Dad, Dad, did he respond in any no. way? No. And he was gagging? Yes. And what did you do at that at that point? Um, I called 911. Where, where were you when you called 911? I believe I ran into the kitchen to call 911. There, was there a phone on your dad's desk? Yes. But you didn't use that no. phone? No. Um, why? You know, I've been asked why. I was about to ask you, why did you not use that I don't that know. Phone? I don't know if it was just the sheer terror of what I saw that in, in that room. Um, I don't know. There's no... You know, I don't, I don't think anybody can really answer why. He's gushing blood. <laughs> All right, listen to me. Is this in private house? Yes, it is. All right, now, listen. You go to way. Listen to me. Yes. I'm sending you an ambulance. Okay. I want you to take a clean towel. Yes. Wrap wherever he's gushing blood from. Okay. Hold pressure on it. Okay. Lay him down if possible. Okay. Get his feet elevated, and we'll have someone down there for you. Okay. I remember running back to my room, getting a towel, and I remember getting a pillow from somewhere. I don't even remember where now. Um, because my father was in the chair, I had to get him out of the chair. Um, and somehow I did. I don't remember how exactly, but I did. You have no recollection of how you got him out of the chair? No. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I lifted him out, whether I pulled him out. Um, but I know I was able to get him out of the chair. And was he still bleeding? Yes. Can you describe again? The, well, the I, I, you know, I don't know if, if he was actually bleeding because I don't think that was a primary concern. I think I was more interested in helping him, you know, and all I remember doing was elevating his feet with the pillow um, and placing the towel uh, over the wound. Okay. And you were screaming for your mother? Yes. And what, what, what did you do then? Um, started running from room to room to room um, and ended up running. You know, I, I remember going to the garage, looking to see if the cars were out. Okay, none of the cars were out. Um, started going through the rooms. Okay, didn't ever find anything. Um, finally, I went back into my parents' room and I saw her there on the floor. Where was she on the floor? Uh, on the other side of her bed. The, the curtains were open a little bit, um, and after the fact, I learned that there was a TV on the whole time uh, with the volume off. What, were you frightened? Absolutely. Well, tell us something about that um, fear that you had in you. It was, it was a combination. It, it was frightened, um, devastation, confusion. Uh, wasn't really sure if this was reality. It was 6.15 in the morning, I got a phone call, uh, woke me up out of a deep sleep, and I looked at the clock when the phone rang, because you're startled out of sleep, so you want to see what time it is, and it, the clock read about 6.15, and I picked up the phone, and Marty was on the other end of the line, and he said, get over here. I said, what's the matter? He said, agitated, not hysterical, agitated. Uh, something happened to my parents. What do you mean something happened to your parents? I don't know, something happened to my parents. I said, well, you'll have to be a little bit more specific, Marty. I don't, what are you talking about? And he said, I think they're dead. And my first inclination was that he was like sleepwalking and he was imagining the whole thing in his head. And I said, Marty, what are you talking about? And that's when he screamed to me, just get over here. And he hung up the phone. Well, he called uh, hysterically crying and, and saying something happened to his parents, something happened to his parents, and 
it was, you know, I, I was sleeping. I woke up and I got this phone and I didn't know what he was saying. He was hysterical. I, at that point, figured there was nothing I could do since I'd already called 911 that I, you know, better leave just, just in case there was somebody else there. Did you have any other thoughts at that time? No. So you left the house, you went, knocked on the neighbor's door, the neighbor responded? Yes. And what happened then? Um, like I said, within maybe 30 seconds to a minute, um, a police car drove up. Um, and at some point, I started, we, we started to be questioned by um, what I learned, to be, learned were detectives. When I first got to the scene, I believe there were three police officers uh, at the scene. They had the scene taped off. And I know, observed a young uh, male uh, sitting on a uh, railroad tie wall, uh, partially up the driveway. Uh, and I spoke to the officers about what they had. Uh, I asked them who that person was, and he advised me that he was the uh, victim's son. What happened? Where'd you go last night? Who do you think did this? Uh, why do you think this happened? What's your name? Uh, it was just, you know, one question after another. One of the first things he said to me, as I recall, was uh, actually, I think it was the, almost the very first thing he said to me was, uh, I know who did this. And I, I, was, I remember being taken aback somewhat, and I said, well, how do you know who did this? And he said, because it was my father's business partner. Um, I said, Jerry Sturman. And why did you say Jerry Sturman? He owed my father a lot of money, and my father's business partnership and relationship was deteriorating. Uh, and he explained to me that they had a, some sort of a big argument over a uh, bagel business. And after he explained that to me, uh, my, I uh, started asking him about, well, what time he went to bed, and I, I asked him what transpired the night before, and uh, he explained to me about how the card game was uh, running and everything, and that uh, uh, who, who the people were at the card game. We know there was a card game that night. We know it went till 3 o'clock in the morning. We know that... Uh, that Stewartman stayed behind to talk with, with Seymour Tankliff. We know that a card player came back in uh, after everybody left and found the conversation was very heated and, and not the type of situation that he wanted to interrupt, um, and he left. into Seaside Drive now here in Beltier. It was at number 33 where the Tankliff family lived the good life high above the waters of the Long Island Sound. And on our left, the house with the Halloween decorations right here is the home of Seymour and Arlene Tankliff where they were found that morning of September 7th, 1988. In front of this driveway on my left, Marty Tankliff was seated barefoot on the hood of a police vehicle being questioned by detectives McCready and Ryan. I was moved to basically the driveway of the neighbor's house, which was 150 to 200 feet away from the driveway of my house. And did they direct you to go there? Yes. Or? Yes. Who, who was it that directed you to go there? Best of my recollection, it was McCready. Uh, we, we brought him over by our uh, police car, and he was, sitting, uh, he was sitting up on the hood of the police car, uh, again, in a very relaxed position, uh, uh, very relaxed mode. And at this point, and throughout the whole morning, I was barefoot, still wearing the shorts, still wearing the sweats, sweater, uh, sweatshirt. At what point in your mind did Marty Tankliff become a suspect? in that case? Um, it was about 8.35 about in the morning. And what is it that made him a suspect in your mind? The inconsistencies in the evidence that I saw and the story that he told. While Marty was being relentlessly questioned by the detectives, his father was transported to the emergency room of the local hospital. He was immediately moved to University Hospital for neurosurgery in a desperate effort to save his life. He was in a coma from which he was never to recover. At this very moment, this incredible case might have turned dramatically with the arrival at the crime scene of this man, Myron Fox. And when I mentioned Uncle Mike, both their heads turned and looked away. Um, when they looked away, I turned around and I saw my Uncle Mike's car. 
I'm gonna say, and as a matter of fact, there's Uncle Mike now. And you said, there's Uncle Mike. There's Uncle and Mike. Happened? McCready took off running. I went over and, and spoke to him. Uh, he introduced himself to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think he even gave me one of his business cards. And as I recall, uh, and I explained to him that we were in the process of interviewing uh, uh, Marty. And uh, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember what he said. I think he was, I think he said something about he was going to go to the hospital or whatever, and if I needed anything, I should contact him there uh, at the hospital. That's, did, he, did he ever tell you that he represented Marty? Or oh, absolutely he? not. That came up during the course of the trial. Uh, that man outright lied through his teeth about that. There's just no way. I mean, if he, if, when, when he finally did come forward and say that, that was sometime about one, one something in the afternoon, when I remember. I think it was 120 time. in the afternoon. 120, 120, something like that, 122, something like that. Uh, it, when he did finally say that, the whole questioning was stopped of, of, of Marty Tankliff at that time. So if he had said that to you that morning before 8.30, what would you have done? I would have stopped talking to the kid. I mean, it was, I wouldn't have had any choice. And at that point, it was when I said to, I don't know if it was McCready, Ryan, or the other, I want to go to the hospital. Uh, McCready's response will take you there. Never ever once asked to go to the hospital or uh, didn't even ask about his father how he was doing. We ended up actually getting to a point of travel where we were nowhere near the hospital. I said, where are we going? I said, I want to go to the hospital. He said, well, I'll take you there later. He said, but I need to take you to Yapang to get a statement from you. I said, no, I want to go to the hospital. He said, no. He said, we're going to go to Yapang. He said, we need some more information on Jerry Stuerman. Marty was taken from the crime scene directly to the back entrance of police headquarters. It was here, in a windowless room, that interview became interrogation. The room was very small. Um, there were points where I was basically cordoned into a little corner. Um, and there were times that Ryan was on one side of me, had his hands on my knees or my shoulders, and he was trying to comfort me. Um, there were other times that he was up screaming and yelling. Um, there were also times when McCready was on the other side of the desk, screaming and yelling at me. And what would they say to you? Um, you know, enough of this already. We know you did it. You know, just tell us you did it. That's all we need to hear. That's all we want to know. Um, but, you know, they weren't the only ones. I can remember, you know, later in the day, I don't know what time it was, uh, I believe it was Sergeant Doyle, you know, who threw me up against the wall. Once had to go to a, a, a periodontist to have some work done, and uh, I, my gums unfortunately were bleeding. And I, I went to the dentist about 11:30 at night. And he shot adrenaline into my gums and stopped the bleeding. And I don't. I, it was based on that that I came up with this idea that his father. You know, he obviously he knows his father was bleeding. We're talking about blood, blood, blood. So I walked over to the one desk, dialed the extension for the desk closest to the interview room. And when that rang, I got up and walked over there and answered my own phone call. And I just made, like I, had, I was having a conversation with my comedy. And uh, after that conversation, I hung up and I said, Marty, I said, that was the detective I spoke to before. He's at the hospital. I said, they just told me that your father, they pumped him full of uh, adrenaline. And uh, they came out of the coma. And he's saying, it's you, Marty. You're the one that did it. Uh, and I remember McCready coming in. Uh, kind of pushing me into the corner with his finger, because he po pointed his finger into my chest and said, Marty, we got you. And I had no idea what he was talking about. He said, well, we just pumped your father full of adrenaline. And he said, you did it. He said, we've got it on tape. And he wants you to tell us why you did it. And that's when I said, no way. He's lying. That's not true. I didn't do anything. There came a point when you tell them what they wanted yeah. to hear. Why would you do that? It was a way to escape the confines of that environment. You know, was it the truth? No. You know, they wanted to hear lies. They, I, they were told lies. So what did you tell them? Whatever they wanted to hear. It's significant that Martin Tancliffe was 17 years old and had no experience with the police when this interrogation had occurred. They led him to believe through their evidence ploys that he committed a crime that he had no memory of. They told him falsely that there was evidence of his guilt in this crime, which there wasn't. They told him that there was a humidity test that showed he had taken a shower to clean off the blood. 
There was no such humidity test. They told him that his father had woken up from a coma at the hospital and identified him as the perpetrator. In fact, that had not occurred. Martin Tankliff reasoned that the evidence demonstrated he was guilty, he must have done something, and he tried to retrieve memories of, of the crime. And his confession statement to the police is an attempt to satisfy their need to come up with an explanation for their false evidence ploys. I received a call from Mike Fox, who was very close to Seymour uh, Tankliff and the entire family. He called me, I guess, about uh, 12.45, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, saying that um, uh, he identified himself, saying that there was a real problem, that Marty, the, the son of Seymour and Arlene Tankliff, uh, was down at uh, Homicide Headquarters, was being questioned, and he was now concerned that they were thinking that he might be a suspect. Uh, he knew of me, and uh, I said, stop the conversation, let's hang up, as I want to call over. My recollection is there were a couple of calls. Uh, one was from Bob Gottlieb, who eventually did represent Tankliff at the trial itself. And the other one was from another attorney. My recollection is a family friend, if I'm not mistaken. I went to the 6th Precinct. They brought me into a small room, uh, it's a sterile room. He was brought in in, uh, in in a paper jumpsuit because they had removed his clothing. And in walks Marty Tankliff, and he looked like a baby. Police know where to look. They look in the family. Well, who was in the family? Who's in the family? That well, Marty Tank was the only. Why is he left alive? It's a crucial question. Mother and father are almost. The father's almost half dead. Wasn't killed outright. The mother is dead. Marty's alive. Well, he becomes the suspect. What do the police do? They separate Marty away from his family. He's isolated. He's alone. He's alienated. He's by himself. He's being questioned by police three or four times at the scene, then taken away to the, to the, without his family, without legal representation. He's taken off to Suffolk County Police Headquarters in Yapank. I mean, you can't fault it. The police are doing their job. They think they got their man. They're, they're listening to his story. They're looking for holes in it. They think, in their, they, think they find something. 20, within less than in eight, ten hours, they got their man, or their boy in this case. They got their boy. The next time I actually heard from Marty himself, he was calling me from jail. But I do remember him saying to me, I need you, I need you to be with me. And I said, why? And he said, um, I said, did you tell them you did this? And he said, yes. And I said, why? And he said, I had to. They made me. Now, there is one very curious aspect of this case, which by itself takes it out of the ordinary. All of Seymour's and Arlene's relatives, brother, sister, niece, and nephew, believe in Marty's innocence, even until this day. Well, I had a little time to think about um, what had happened. And of course, I had to consider the possibility that he could do it, because I didn't know all the facts, and I hadn't heard everything. So I waited until I saw him, which I knew would be in county jail, would be the next time. And I thought, I'll know when I see him if he did it or not. And as soon as I saw him and he brought the Kleenex out to greet us, I knew that there was no way that he did it. I didn't believe it at that time because I knew of the relationship between Marty and his parents. And it was inconceivable that it could have been Marty. So I, I think that, you know, as far, from physical strength, no way. Um, emotionally, no way. Um, no, it's just, it, to us, it was just impossible. So what you're actually saying is that this entire case against Marty Tankliff rested upon the so-called confession? The, the prosecution uh, claims in, in their summation, they're the first ones to say, you know what, we have a confession, but obviously the confession isn't being truthful. And they can't be responsible. They're just re repeating to the jury what they say Marty Tankliff said. But don't believe the details of the confession because it's true. There's no forensic evidence to corroborate, to support what Marty uh, supposedly said. The only thing we want you to believe about the confession is the part where Marty said, I did it. There was no forensic evidence linking Marty Tankliff to this brutal murder. He had told me that at one point when he assisted his father, 
that he picked it, you know, he had, his hands had gotten bloody. And then he went to look for his mother, and he went to the garage, and opened the garage door, and there's no blood on the garage door. He said, then he goes to his bedroom and turns the light switch on, and uh, there's blood on the wall. So I'm saying, well, how does blood get on the wall but doesn't get on the doorknob when he, when he turns the doorknob? And, no, and he had to undo a deadbolt, deadbolt to get into the garage. And then he went, goes and looks at his mother, looks for his mother again, and he's, he's back and forth all over the place. He couldn't keep his consistent story in terms of the amount of blood and when he got blood and when he didn't get blood on his hands. And I think that was the biggest thing that tripped him up. I'm about to meet with a man whom I consider to be very courageous. He is an active member of the Suffolk County Police Department. He's a uniformed sergeant, and he's been on the force for 23 years. Now, he was not directly involved with the Tankleth investigation, but he certainly was aware of the case. And he's going to tell us about the reputation of the Suffolk County Homicide Squad back in 1988. Back then, I was a uniformed patrol officer. I was uh, driving a sect car. And uh, did you know of or did you know uh, Detective McCready, James, specifically James McCready? Yes, I did. Uh, I can't say I was a personal friend, but I knew him and I knew his, uh, him by reputation. And what was Detective McCready's reputation in the police department at that time? He had a reputation of being a little uh, wild man, I would guess is a way I would put it. Someone who's willing to do anything he has to do to get a case, what he feels, done. They really didn't follow through with an investigation the way you would normally. They, they didn't look for forensic evidence, corroborating evidence, uh, witnesses that might corroborate things. They basically picked up who they felt was the guilty party um, and would bring them to headquarters and get a confession. Uh, and to use some of their own words, they would do whatever they had to do to get that confession. I didn't come from a family of three homicide detectives and a history of police work to go out and arrest innocent people. You just don't do that. There is no better crime to investigate than murder. And it's the most exciting thing you can do. There's, you know, what do you, what do you investigate after you investigate murder? Burglary? You know, doesn't come close. See, this, this is what's amazing, and this is why it's so clear that Marty is innocent, and the so-called confession is nothing more than the police's story. This, this is what they thought must have happened, because they also have Marty going through supposedly in great detail that he commits these murders, and then before the police arrive, they have him going into his bathroom, taking a shower to wash off all of his blood, taking a shower where if not only blood, but he had to have washed off the knife and the murder weapon. And you would expect, or anyone listening would expect in these brutal, brutal murders that somewhere in this bathroom, whether it's in the crevices of the, uh, of, of the, of the shower, on the, on the tile, in the grout, or in the trap, you know, going down the drain, you would find maybe a piece of human tissue maybe a hair, maybe some blood. You know that's what you would find. And the police, you know, they did a great job here. They, they, they scoured the bathroom. They actually took out the drain, the trap, to test it because they were convinced they were going to find some forensic evidence, some evidence of having been used to wash off not only Marty Tancliffe, but the murder weapon. And it's negative, zero. Nothing was in the trap. According to the police version of what took place that morning, based on the alleged oral confession taken by Detective McCready, Marty, who was naked, awoke from sleep, obtained a watermelon knife from the kitchen and a dumbbell bar, quietly entered his mother's bedroom, where he brutally stabbed and bludgeoned her to death. He then walked through the house to his father's study where he found Seymour dozing behind his desk and also bludgeoned him and nearly decapitated him with a knife. What's the problem? Leaving him comatose and bleeding to death, he then went into the shower where, using a loofah sponge, he washed away any trace of blood and tissue 
from the knife, the dumbbell bar, and himself. Within days, or within moments, quite frankly, not only from Marty, but from family members, I'm learning about other things that Seymour Tancliffe was involved in, other people who may have been involved, which immediately tells me, well, did the police investigate these people? Why did they rush so quickly to arrest Marty? Seymour Tancliffe supposedly was a retired insurance agent, but with a lot of money and was involved in an inordinate number of business deals. People who potentially would have had the motive to, uh, to, to kill. As I delved deeper and deeper into the facts of this intriguing case, repeatedly reviewing the crime scene video and examining the evidence, I realized that there was more to this extraordinary story than met the eye. Not only was there a gross lack of evidence, but there were questions constantly arising which pointed in yet another direction. On the desk, covered with blood or splattered with blood, was a demand note from Seymour Tancliffe. It was a copy of a demand note from Seymour Tancliffe, sent special delivery to Jerry Stuerman, demanding payment of, of a note. And, uh, and if not, was going to take action on the horses and, and various other things. So, I mean, I mean, how can you ignore the fact that there was, you know, that there were serious financial um, uh, disputes going on? Um, he was very close with Jerry. Then they wouldn't talk. Then they would be very close. Um, but towards the end, it was not a very good relationship. And what Storman did was some of the money that he had borrowed, he went and bought equipment so that he could open up satellite stores throughout the county. And obviously, as we well know today, I think he's doing very well with it. So when the proceeds from the one store that was a payback disc loan, when Seymour realized that how much potential there was for Jerry to make off these other satellite stores, Seymour went through the roof. And that's what this argument was over. Seymour said, I've got a chattel on the, that equipment. And Jerry agreed with him, and he said, yes, I know, you, you have a, a chattel on the equipment, but that doesn't mean you have a chattel on my satellite stores. They seem to be uh, going back and forth, Arlene and Cy, and finally I sat down in the breakfast nook, and I said, what's wrong, Cy? And he said, well, he said, I want to pick up my checks from uh, Jerry Stewerman, and he, he attacked me verbally. He went on into detail about, uh, he said in front of customers in the store, and grabbed him by the neck and pulled him to the counter and said, you bastard, you want to own me. You won't be happy until you own me. Now you've had a lot of opportunity to examine the crime scene, to go through the crime scene. Have you come to any conclusions or any theories as how this murder could have taken place if Marty were not involved? I mean, it doesn't take a very bright guy to figure out how this must have taken place. Because in between these two rooms, on white carpeting, on the floors, even the tiles in some of the rooms, there's no evidence of blood. There's no dropping of blood. So logic tells you that whoever is doing this, whether it's one person, two people, one person must have been killed. They should have shot, they probably shot out the back of one of the rooms, going through the sliding glass doors, coming in the other room, committing the murder, and then leaving without going through the house back and forth between the two rooms. I mean, that's just logic and common sense. Why do I need to pay it back? Because I've had just about enough. In the belief that Marty Tankliff was not responsible for these murders, a common theory has evolved as to how the crimes were probably committed. One week after Arlene's murder, with Seymour still in a coma, Jerry Sturman, the self-proclaimed bagel king of Long Island, stages his own abduction and disappears to California, changing his identity, shaving off his beard, and having his hairpiece rewoven. The day after the murder, before he fled, 
he withdrew $15,000 from a joint account that he had with Seymour and Arlene Tankliff. So while he is grieving and so upset about his good friend, both Arlene and Seymour Tankliff, his first reaction is to go to the bank the next day and withdraw $15,000. Something tells me that warranted further investigation by the police. I believe we found somebody in the hotel that said that he had uh, taken a Winston limousine or gotten, they thought they, somebody that fit his description got into a Winston limousine. Then we checked with the airlines and we found out that we had a, uh, a Jerry Winston who paid cash for his, uh, for his airline ticket. Well, we wanted to know where he was, um, certainly. And uh, we subsequently got some information f that he had called his girlfriend and uh, the police were able to track down where that phone call came from. And so we went out to California, myself and two other two detectives went out to California to see if we could track him down. Well, in this case here, it wasn't, I think we were, we were more concerned with the public perception than we were of anything else. And now it was just that he, he created, the problem he created for us was not that, uh, that we had to prove that he's now the murderer. Okay, what we, what the problem he created for us was that we had to do 10 times the work to prove that he wasn't the murder and, and murderer, only because of what the public's perception was. At the point he disappeared, he was, he was not a suspect to the police, although I believe there was some um, people saying that he might be a suspect, but the police did not think of him as a suspect. And, wh and why was that? Well, at that point, they already had... Uh, conversation with Mr. Tankliff saying exactly what he had done and uh, when you have a conversation by that there's, there's really no reason to think that somebody else is a suspect. If Jerry really wanted to get lost they wouldn't have found him. And you know I know that Jerry has in the past done some rather um, crazy things. I remember hearing a story about uh, him chaining himself to uh, I don't know if the Social Security office or, or the tax office or something, you know, until, until he got results of something. So I know Jerry was, was, you know, he did crazy things. After indictment, the case was assigned to Judge Alfred Tisch. In the spring of 1988, pretrial hearings began amid all kinds of controversy in the Suffolk County Court in Riverhead, New York. We go through these pretrial hearings and there was a lot of attention. It was very contentious. And uh, Judge uh, Al Tish, he was a judge at the time, he's no longer a judge, was presiding. Before those hearings, there had been some rumors that Al Tish was interested in being the Republican nominee for district attorney. Everyone knew I was going to be the Democratic nominee, so he was my potential rival. One Sunday, I believe, I wake up and I pick up Newsday, our major newspaper here in Long Island, and the lead article is, it would appear that Al Tisch is now going to get the nomination for the Republican, from the P Republican Party to run against Robert Gottlieb, the district attorney. And the next day, we were in court, and there was tension. The judge wouldn't even see us in chambers. He said, if you have anything to say, you'll say it in open court. There is tension beyond belief. If this conflict really existed now, we were going to ask that he get himself off the case. And then we'd figure out whether or not we were going to have to hold hearings again or have another judge look at the, the minutes. We didn't even know where this was going to go. After two years of being free on one million dollars bail, and after months of hearings and trial, the case was about to reach a climax for Marty with the jury verdict on June 28, 1990. Um, I remember the jury coming in and the judge saying, have you reached a verdict? Uh, the jury is saying yes. Were you standing or seated at this point? Uh, at that point I was seated. Um, once I said yes, then I believe the judge asked myself and the attorneys to stand. Um, at that point, the, I don't know if it was the judge or the jury foreman uh, issued their verdict. Ask the defendant, Martin Tankless, as to count two, murder, second degree, guilty. <laughs> Guilty. There's nothing that can describe it. 
I cannot possibly describe to you or anyone else how based on the, the prosecution's case, the reaction at that point is just, it, saying the, the, it's like you're, you're hit in the stomach and the air is taken out of you, doesn't even do it justice. It has been said that one of the main reasons that Marty was convicted was that he displayed no emotion while on the stand. Well, if you had it to do all over again, and you may someday have it to do all over again, would you take the stand again? Yes. Why? Tell, us, tell my side, tell but, the truth. But wouldn't you be concerned that a jury might look at you again and say, gee, that guy is so unemotional that he's probably guilty? Would that concern you? It would, but you know, if, if you don't take the stand, okay, who's gonna really know the truth? Nobody. That's why I'm here today. That's why I took the stand, okay? How often do you see people take the stand, defendants? Innocent defendants take the stand. They've got nothing to hide. I've got nothing to hide. It's easy for me to say that I wish he had not testified. I'm not convinced it would have changed the verdict. I'm not convinced that if he had not testified that this jury, whatever was going on inside that jury room, that they would not have ultimately decided to convict him based on something else. But it made it easier for them to say, well, we saw him on the stand and now as a lawyer, what happens is, okay, we have the prosecution's story, and we have the defendant's story. Which one do we believe? And they said, we, believe, we don't believe the defendant, because we didn't like the way he, he looked. We didn't like the way he uh, did not emote on the stand. Therefore, we're going to buy the prosecution's story. If he had not testified, then our argument that the prosecution, the government, failed to prove its case would still have been there. And I just think that by testifying, it made the, the jury gave them an easy way out, saying, we didn't like the way he looked or appeared on the stand. Marty was remanded to the county jail to await sentence, while Sherry, who now believed he was guilty, contested her father's will. My father's will provided a large amount of money to Hofstra University, uh, set up in a college endowment fund. Um, and probably 80% of the rest of it was left to me and 10% to Shari Rothen. And I said to Marty, look, you know that daddy, you know, this was not, this is not right. You and I need to talk. I said, because at the very least, you know who's going to make out on this? The lawyers. We don't want that. And he looked at me sitting on my couch with a face as straight as all get out and said to me, sorry, it's all mine. How did you feel about that? I wanted to choke him. I wanted to choke him. You felt it was unfair? I felt that he wasn't a part of this family. He was brought into this family. Don't throw your weight around with me. Because with everything I have, I will fight you. You know, money has no bearing on my life. Uh, obtaining my freedom and finding out the truth is what's important. As you sit here today, what do you think of Shari Rother? Not much. There's not much to think. Because she contested the estate? Because she contested the estate, because she threw a party after she got her share of the money to celebrate. You know, obtaining money from the death of my father and having a party is disgusting. Now the controversy in this case didn't end with the guilty verdict or even the sentence. You know, it's been said, Sherry, that you went into business uh, with Jimmy McCready. Mm -hmm. Is that a fact? Absolutely not. I did not. My ex-husband went into business with Jim McCready. I even expressed to him my, my concern and uh, my trepidation about his doing that. He wanted to do it anyway, and so he did. Was any of your money used to, to construct the restaurant? Yeah, actually it was my money, um, but that was my husband at the time. And um, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I did what I felt that I had to do to try and salvage my disintegrating marriage, I guess. And a bartender friend of mine, um, 
he, I had asked him to come into the business with me because I really didn't know much about the business. Well, it turned out that he was friends with Ronnie Rotha. And one night in a conversation between the three of us, it was Ronnie kind of asked if he could get in and, and involved in it. And we thought it would be a good idea because we thought he was a good businessman. And, uh, and that's how the whole thing developed. But so, uh, Sherry had nothing to do with it. But, but Sherry told us that her money was used by Ronnie. Uh, very, very, very possible. Uh, you know, very possible. But Sherry had nothing to do with the business. So she, you didn't consider yourself to be partners with, with Sherry? Her? No, not at all. After meeting with Detective McCready in North Carolina, and in an effort to tie up the loose ends in this case, we traveled to the state of Florida to meet with Myron Fox. I wanted to hear his version of what happened in front of 33 Seaside Drive on that fateful morning in 1988. I've just come from a meeting with Uncle Mike, and I can only say that I've left that meeting very frustrated. Uncle Mike, or Myron Fox, is the one person who could have told us what really happened on the morning of September 7, 1988, when he talked to Detective McCready. He knew about the relationships between Jerry and Seymour, and he had so much information to give us in our quest for truth in this case. But yet, sadly, he absolutely refused to go on camera. One can only wonder why. feel confident that you're going to get him out? I don't know. Every time I think that uh, we get closer, um, something gets in the way. This gives me hope, being able to, to speak about it and, and uh, relay to people that this does happen to people. People don't understand, how can you get in this position and have your, your nephew in prison for 50 years to life? They just don't understand. It's surreal. So. I just have a lot of hope because we have a lot of support and we'll, we'll continue to do it as long as we have to. So I know that in our system it is so imperfect. You can never assume that justice will be done during the trial. And the history of this case is you can't even assume justice will be done on three or four appellate levels on the appeals. But I still think that justice will be done. I don't know when or where, but ultimately the truth will come out about this case. If they had proved to me that Marty had done this, as I said to my children, I said, we will just have to, we'll still stick with him. Uh, I said, if in any way we, they can prove it, I said, we'll just have to do the best we can. And have they proven that to you? No. I've never arrested an innocent man in my life. I never will. Ever. The kid tripped himself up. Granted, he's 17 years old. But we operated within the law. I didn't do anything with that kid that I wasn't entitled to do. I advised him of his rights. The kid was treated perfectly. He's just mad at himself now. Do you ever have any second thoughts or any doubts about his guilt in this case? No. Many, many times people say to me, do you think he really did it? And I say to them, no, I absolutely know he did it. I don't have to think that he did it. I know he did it. How anyone could be convicted on, a, on the basis of that story I have kids, and they're probably kids in the third grade that can make up a better murder to that story than that one. But he was convicted on that. That's the confession. And it's, uh, to me, that's the prime reason he shouldn't, at least one of the prime reasons he shouldn't be sitting in jail right now. Because it's just absurd. One can only imagine what it must be like to be 18 years old. You've lost both of your parents. They've been brutally murdered. You're innocent, and yet you're charged with the murders. And after eight days of deliberations, the jury has found you guilty of these crimes. You're about to spend the rest of your life in prison. I'm a victim of circumstances. I'm a victim of this system, of this country. Um, 
of the way people resort to brutality to solve financial problems. But I'm innocent, you know, and if there's somebody out there or some people who know the truth, you know, for my sake, for my parents' sake, for my family's sake, that's all I want. I want the truth to be told. In this troubling case, we have traveled thousands of miles and heard from many witnesses. Still, the truth remains elusive. There is truly a question of guilt. Despite their wealth, Arlene and Seymour Tancliffe have been laid to rest in very modest graves. Sadly, the two people who could answer the question as to what happened that morning have been silenced forever. Thank you.